name is George Craw. Uh, my wife, uh, Rayfield, and I are sponsoring this series to show the really spectacular work that's being done in science and technology at Santa Cruz uh, here in Silicon Valley. And tonight we're going to be uh, have a, I think, especially important uh, uh, presentation about the work that's being done uh, using big data and genomics to help uh, developed targeted specialized cancer treatments for children. So I'm going to introduce uh, Isabel Bork, who will be introducing our panel. Thank you, George. I'm going to move this so I can see everybody. Um, so thank you for supporting the series, but also thank you for supporting uh, the work that we do at UC Santa Cruz in um, pediatric cancer. We do this work because every day, 43 kids are diagnosed with cancer. And horrifyingly, um, the recent uh, statistics are that there's 15,000 families who will be told in a year that their kids have cancer. So the 43 number is just in the US. That doesn't tell you about everything that's happening in the world, and the 15,000 is across the world. So we know that this is an incredibly important issue. It's touched all of us. Unfortunately, I think all of us have had the experience of knowing somebody with cancer. Um, I certainly have known many people with cancer. I also, not just from the work that I've done at UC Santa Cruz, but through life, have known kids and their families who have had cancer. So this work is really important to us. My name is Isabel Bjork. Um, I have the privilege of directing what we're calling the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative. That is the pediatric cancer arm of UCSC's Genomics Institute. We have been working at UCSC in pediatrics since 2014, 2015, officially as Treehouse since 2015. So at that, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how this evening's going to go, and then introduce our speakers. We're going to have about an hour to talk. The panel will, will discuss for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have 20 minutes for questions. We really encourage you to ask questions. We want to address any, um, any thoughts you have about this subject, anything that we haven't made clear to you, okay? So with that, um, we will start with Lauren Sanders. Lauren is a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, working under David Hausler, and she is working within our Treehouse team. And she came to us from, by way of Berkeley as an undergrad, and then UCSF working there. David Hausler has so many titles, it will be difficult for me to get through all of them, but let me say he is a distinguished professor at UCSC. He is the scientific director of the Genomics Institute. He is an HHMI investigator. And for the purposes tonight, we are very grateful to David, who worked to help co-found the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative. Next, we are very pleased to have Norman Lacayo here. Norman is an associate professor at Stanford, and he is an oncologist at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. He is an expert in leukemia, and um, we're very privileged to have him join us. He is one of our partners at Stanford, and we'll be telling you about that project. And then finally, we have Elena Morozova. So Elena is currently at UCSF. She is getting a fellowship in clinical molecular genomics. She did five years as a postdoc under David Hausler. And during that time, she brought UCSC from having no pediatric cancer work to leading the Treehouse Initiative, which now has a very strong staff of scientists, of computer uh, experts, of engineers, and um, many PhD students and undergraduates who come who are interested in working with our program. So she's done amazing work with us. Tonight, we want to tell you a little bit about what Treehouse does and a little bit about what the UCSC Genomics Institute does, but a lot about a new project that we have. We are extremely pleased to have gotten funding from the California Governor's Office. This is the second funding award that we've gotten from the California Governor's Office. 
And it's an initiative in precision medicine that Jerry Brown has put forth, and we're incredibly grateful to him and to the governor's office generally because they took what was a pilot idea and turned it into an extraordinary program. This program that starts in January is with Stanford. They are the one clinical partner that we're working with for this particular program. What we will be doing is working with 20 to 30 kids at Stanford. These are kids who are sadly out of treatment options. They're kids who have relapsed um, or who have di been diagnosed with di diseases for which there is no clear successful therapy. And so what we are trying to do is discover whether genomics can lead to information that can help these children. And our goal in this program is not just to do the genomic analysis for these kids, but it's also to figure out what we can do to help the clinical oncologists, um, to help them as they're trying to treat these children who are out of treatment options, but also to help explain what genomics is to the families and to the kids and to their teams. They work, of course, with a wide group of people from the nurse oncologist to um, all of the clinical staff. And genomics is really quite difficult to understand. So part of what we're trying to do with this work with Stanford is figure out what helps clinicians make decisions and use genomics? What helps families understand what genomics can offer for these kids? And what helps those families explain to their kids what on earth is going on with genomic analysis and what the hope is for the future for these children? So with that, I would like to start with Elena. Elena um, is kind of amazing in a million ways. Um, but one of the really interesting things about Elena is that she's been committed to pediatric cancer genomics from very early on. And so in her undergraduate work and in her graduate work in Canada, she focused on molecular genetics, specifically with kids and what difference could be made with kids. And somewhere along the line, she decided for her postdoc work, when she could have gone anywhere, to come to UCSC and to work with David Hausler at the Genomics Institute. And so I'd like to start just by asking Elena to explain how you ended up here. Um, thank you, Isabella, and thank you all for being here. It's so, excited, ex so exciting to see so many of you coming out and supporting this really important cause. So um, as mentioned, I did my PhD in Vancouver, British Columbia and studying the genetics of a particular type of pediatric cancer called neuroblastoma. And so, I don't know if you know, probably most people know that cancer is a genetic disease, or now we say it's a genomic disease. So it's a disease of mistakes or errors in the DNA. And so when I was doing my PhD in Vancouver, that was the time when new sequencing technologies were kind of developing and coming online. And so everybody was sequencing stuff and, you know, sequencing cancers. And so my project was to sequence the DNA of neuroblastoma cancers. And so what was very interesting in that project and very frustrating actually for my PhD is that we found nothing. We sequenced the DNA of those cells and we did not find any common spelling mistakes or mutations that could be targeted by drugs. And so we were all frustrated. Our group was frustrated. Everybody in the field was frustrated. And what uh, it meant is that we need to look beyond just simple spelling mistakes in the DNA as we do in adults. And so with that, uh, I figured, okay, what to do next? I do want to work in pediatric cancer, but clearly we need to do something more and we need to do something uh, more sophisticated than just simple analysis of genetic data. And so I came to uh, David Hausler's group because this was the best bioinformatic program, and really, I wanted to be part of the best program and, and see if we can, um, if I can learn that type of expertise um, that uh, David has here at UC Santa Cruz. And what was also, I guess, faithful is that at the time I came to UC Santa Cruz, I met a staff member called uh, Katrina Learned. She's not here tonight, but she's a member of the Treehouse team actually right now. She's our staff member. And uh, Katrina's daughter, Aurora, was undergoing treatment for neuroblastoma, the exact cancer I was studying in my PhD, and so it was fate. 
And um, uh, several people at UCSC decided to organize a fundraiser in Aurora's honor um, to honor her, her journey because, you know, these treatments are very tough and it was a lot of, um, a lot of trouble for the family. And so we organized this fundraiser and Melissa Klein was one of the members of that team. She is in the audience as well, I think, or she was. Um, and so we thought that that fundraiser was going to be a small uh, kind of desk in the biomedical sciences building, but turned out to be a huge uh, fundraiser raising $12,000 for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. And the whole community really came together, um, staff members at UCSC, community members, just everybody supported this cause and took it to their heart. And then... Uh, and then Isabel came on board, and she really made uh, what kind of started as a you know rally and disorganized kind of movement into Treehouse Initiative, and which is now a real, real structured program, and now an arm of our new institute. So it's really, really exciting. I'm very, very proud of what uh, this team has been able to accomplish, and I can't wait to see what we can do more. Thank you. Um, the the Alex's Lemonade Stand fundraiser that Elena's talking about happened in 2014. And the first funding was in 2015, right before I came on board. And so that tells you what a short time span it's been since we've done this work at UCSC. And yet the Treehouse Initiative has come so far and is doing such incredible work. It's, it's pretty astounding. And one of the the threshold things that Elena has always put forward is making a difference for kids. And this project that we have with Stanford is a perfect example of how we're able to translate the research that we do, you know, with computers. I mean, you go to our offices at UCSC and it's just a bunch of computers, you know. We have a lot of pictures of kids. Um, but at the end, we have a big bear that, uh, yeah, we have a big stuffed bear. David gave us a bear. It's enormous. And it has a women's engineer's hat on it. Um, but beyond that, the, it's computers. That's what we have. Um, and what matters to us is that we really can use the expertise that we've developed to impact patients. And so with that, um, I'd like to, uh, to ask you, uh, Norman, if you would talk a little bit about what's happening at Stanford and, and particularly your experience integrating genomics into work with patients. Um, first of all, let me just say, I haven't been in a UC for a long time, but I went to UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to UCSF. <laughs> yeah. And my kid's now at Santa Cruz. I know. So. <laughs> um, so thank you for being here. And uh, I think I'm ready to pay back to UC what you know, I got from UC, all the thank UCs. You. <laughs> uh, but thank to go, and, and I just want to preface that there are a lot of threads that have brought me here. Um, and the pediatric cancer community is a small community. There are about 1,400 practitioners, I mean, us who treat kids with cancer in the United States. Um, and one of my dear mentors was Robert Arsisi, who passed away a couple years ago. And he actually somehow connected with Dr. Hausler and the team at Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And Olina mm -hmm. was a big believer in the program. And, and I think he helped you guys in trying to get a grant from uh, yeah, it's a small you know, the St. Baldrick's uh, Foundation. Uh, yeah, we had that successful St. Baldrick's grant, and just when it started, Bob passed away. Absolutely. And then Olina met Alejandro C. Cordero, who was uh, also a student at UCSF, uh, went to school there, and our pediatric residency had a training there. And that's you met Alejandro that also brought you, all you guys, to Stanford mm -hmm. in this project. So. Again, it's a small community, and, and I just want to highlight all these thre threads that brought us all here together. Uh, but, I mean, we have a lot of expertise at Stanford, but I think it's been great having the Santa Cruz group working with us in our patients. Uh, I mean, our, again, we have a strong campus, but it's more devoted to discovery and move on. So I'm glad that we were able to use the resources of Santa Cruz to really to help us take care of our patients. Um, and 
like I said, although we're in a great campus, I mean, we're, we're glad that we're next to another great campus with the resources that could really, really, really help us with, with our patients. And I, uh, so you guys have been on campus with us for now a couple of years, and yeah. we've, you've touched many of our patients, you've helped with many of our patients. Uh, typically, we have a very busy phase one, early phase program, so we have a lot of uh, trials for new agents and children, but unfortunately, we have many children who are multiply relapsed or refractory where, you know, they don't fit in any, any particular trial, and we need more information. That's where, again, our collaboration has been very fruitful. and. You know, we've had many patients where we've had leads on where to go, uh, and we learned from it. And we've, I, you know, sincerely, we've really prolonged the life of many kids through this project. Uh, but we need to move forward and and figure out what, how to really help cure some of these children with refractory relapse disease. I had one particular patient, leukemia, that Alina and the team helped us with, and really we kept this young lady going for a couple of years, and with actually really good quality of life. So again, it's, it's amazing the impact you can have, and again, I wasn't clear about the hit, beginning of history. I can't believe this started with a quick you know, fundraiser, and Alex Lemonade, and a, you know, someone dear to you guys. Quite literally, a lemonade stand. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. <laughs> But that's where we're at now. There's a new, there's a new project that we're, mm -hmm. we're starting. And, and for this collaboration and touching our patients, helping our patients, I think there are other projects that we're embarking on. So there are other leads that we want to pursue with the Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz team uh, in, in relapsed refractory cancer. But there are also opportunities. We belong to different groups, early phase studies. We, we're developing a new consortium with uh, St. Jude Children's Hospital, six institutions in the country. And again, we, we're, we're, we will figure out how to bring our colleagues from Santa Cruz into these, these four to really help us uh, further develop and help us with our patients. Thank you. The um, first time we met Norm was in uh, what we called a molecular tumor board, um, which are these uh, meetings where we present findings based on samples that we've received. And Elena is generally the scientist who presents those findings. And we've been very lucky because when we started, which was just at the beginning of when I started as well with the program, it was this very silent room where Elena was presenting findings and um, people were listening. But it was clear to us that we weren't getting through to people. And so a lot of the work that's happened over the last year, two years, has been understanding how to make genomic analysis integrated with medical care in a way that uh, works for the clinical oncologist, where they can understand and use the information if it's useful. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, the evolution of that experience, because I certainly saw a huge difference in the tumor board presentations and our attempt our attempt to translate what's very difficult work um, into the clinical space and we've learned a lot over time and I've noticed that the clinicians have been very engaged in our last few tumor yeah, boards as well. It's just so challenging. So one fortunately there are not many pediatric cancer patients, right? Mm -hmm. And relatively speaking. I know you, mm -hmm. you talked right. about the fifteen thousand and that's too many. But when you contrast this with adult cancers, more epithelial drug cancers like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, there, there are less cases. Um, but so that leads to a, a unique problem for us where you don't have enough patients really to study all drugs. Uh, we don't have enough cases really to more, do a more molecular dive in into certain diseases and it's quite challenging. So as opposed to the adults where, again, there are more patients, there are more samples available, there are more targets identified. And it's easier, there are more studies done with new drugs and novel drugs. It's easier to find a target and find a drug, but for us it's very difficult. So I think that was our hesitation at the beginning where you guys came with a lot of information 
and a few cases, and then we always have the, the dilemma, is this a mutation, a passenger's a mutation, or is it a, drive, a mutation that drives the cancer of this child? And, mm -hmm. and what does this mean in the context of this child? Everyone is an individual, is unique, has a unique way of handling drugs or handling medications. So, you know, I think we, we had to catch up <laughs> with you guys and try to take the information and, you know, make our best clinical decision possible. And, and again, one thing that makes us different from the adults is, I mean, we had to pick a drug and use it off-label. I mean, it was a drug approved for, let's say, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. <clears throat> And we, put, you know, and if we find a target that may be similar, and we find it in a in a different solid tumor, then we would use the off-label use of the drug and you know treat the patient with it, as long as there was no phase one trial available mm -hmm. either at our center, nearby centers, or anywhere else in the country. So I think that's the evolution you saw that we mm -hmm. just became bolder, given the information you were providing us, and and you know. As time went on and more cases were studied, I think uh, we started working more as a group together and, and t you know, taking a leap of faith and treating some of these children with, again, drugs that were approved for other indications, not necessarily for that specific pediatric cancer. Right. Well, I know that Elena's coined the term molecular detective for the work that we've done, which I think is an excellent mm -hmm. term. Why did you choose that? Well. I, I don't know if I borrowed it maybe from somewhere, so I... Coin the but, term for us. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, we, so pediatric cancers are rare, um, luckily, I mean, but, uh, but too common still, as, as Norm suggested. And um, what's great about Santa Cruz is, you know, we have a lot of students and researchers who have not been exposed to kind of medical research as much as somebody at a medical center. And so they come and they're really, really excited, I think, to work in this field. And they really, we have a lot of uh, people, and Lauren might speak to that later, really, when they're given a case, they dig into it until they solve it, and until at least they find something that could be useful to the clinician. So we never at Treehouse try to say, there is nothing for this child. We always try to dig deeper and find something, uh, some clue. <laughs> or uh, some clinical lead that we could then discuss at the tumor board. And some of those may not be clinically viable, but at least we, we like to look as hard as possible to find something so that we never say there are no options uh, for, for that child. So I think that's and part of the way, And part of the reason we can do this at UC Santa Cruz is because of the depth of knowledge in big data and computational genomics. So David, I'm wondering if you can speak to how that all came to be at the Genomics Institute. Well, thank you. Let, let me first say that um, it has been a, a, a great, great honor to have Elena at Santa Cruz, and she really pushed us into a, into a direction that we are so happy about now, but it required a lot of guts to say, no, we're going to go all the way and help kids. Uh, the, the standard approach in a university that uh, doesn't have a med school itself and is devoted to research as well. We'll publish papers and someone else will see it through. And Elena said, no, I, I want to see it through. I want to see Santa Cruz see it through. Let's, you know, build an, an institution and work with other uh, partners. Uh, and, and I want to thank Norm for actually going along with this. I mean, who, who, who would have expected that we could actually then engage with Stanford and UCSF and um, Orange County and several other places that we did. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to me. You've you know, completely changed the way I think about what I need to do at a university. Um, pushed way beyond, beyond the limits and, and you've been incredibly receptive. So it's been a great honor to work with you. We got our start uh, sequencing the first human genome. So that was the International Human Genome Project. Many of you have heard of this. Um, again, we came in something as outsiders. We were experts in bioinformatics and analyzing the genes and DNA. And uh, they ran into, the public project ran into a problem where they had all of these little pieces of DNA that they couldn't assemble into a coherent genome. And a student at Santa Cruz, Jim Kent, 
um, actually solved that puzzle at the 11th hour, right before uh, they were to announce at the White House the completion of the first draft of the human genome. And that um, started a different tack at Santa Cruz. Again, we weren't just researching and publishing papers, but we were the ones that puzzled together the first draft of the human genome. And we also represented open science. Um, we, I like to say that the first human genome was open source because we put it on the internet uh, without any restrictions on intellectual property uh, attached to it. And that has stimulated biomedical research in an enormous way since that time. We also built the gateway to the human genome, the UCSC Genome Browser, which is used by hundreds of thousands of biomedical researchers all over the world every day. We get a million hits a day at our uh, genome web browser. And we thought at the very beginning, well, um, that's one reference human genome and we're trying to attach all the information we can to it, but what about personal genome sequencing? What about clinical genome sequencing? Can we get to an age where everyone can have their genome sequenced in the appropriate time and place? And the first real push for that was from the National Cancer Institute, uh, where in 2005 they said, well, the, mo the people who need genome sequencing most right now are cancer patients. Again, exactly because, as Elena said, it is a disease of mutations in the DNA. Uh, and so we need to read those. And so we were uh, the main database for the Cancer Genome Atlas Project of the U.S. Uh, that was, again, a great honor. We accumulated uh, 10,000 uh, genomes or so during that time from adult cancers. It was also another program called the Target Program uh, for Childhood Cancers. And so we had a, a lot of experience, and it's at this point that Elena came and said, let's do more with this. And uh, again, that was an exciting next phase for us. And what we do in Treehouse now is every child, we compare, we're, we're able to compare all of the genetic data from every child to all this other data. We have something more than 11,000 11, cases in our compendium now with, with full genetic data. And so we have an extraordinary resource. And that resource is open to the world. We, just a month ago, we officially opened it up so others can map their cases onto it. Again, in the same tradition we have at Santa Cruz, we, we are extreme in terms of we want to really help the world by opening up this information and letting people use it to the maximum. We have an exceptional group uh, at Santa Cruz of incredibly dedicated students and staff who compare literally every case that comes out of every one of the institutions we work with to all of these other cases, molecular detectives that track down what is special about this child's cancer using that incredible information resource and the bioinformatics powerhouse that we built at Santa Cruz. So that really the, um, the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute is unique in terms of computational genomics in the country. We are the strongest group in the country. We, we have a very large staff. What is our staff at this point? Something like... At the Genomics yeah. Institute? 81. 81. Oh, my God. And growing so, every and day. Growing. <laughs> um, so we have 81 staff and a huge number of undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs, uh, and uh, about 14 faculty that are actively engaged in genomics. So we are we are an unusual institution in that way, especially unusual in the sense that we don't ourselves operate a med school. And, and that's one of the reasons why we value our relationships with Stanford and with the other institutions so much. And it's another one of the reasons why we can be the national and international centers for databases, uh, because sometimes the medical students, the medical schools kind of argue with each other about who's the boss of the data and they don't, you know, they don't so, trust each other and so forth. But Santa Cruz is a trusted partner to all when it comes to sharing data and to making sure um, that all of the data are available free without uh, restriction on use. And uh, that in the U.S. and with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, which I co-founded um, and now has more than 500 member organizations around the world. Um, 
are, are places that you can count on for this open source version of biomedicine. And so if you go to uh, the Treehouse website, all you have to do is just Google Treehouse UCSC. We've now, as David um, noted, made everything publicly available. Um, so the data is available. The pipelines that we use to analyze the data is publicly available. Um, and that message of open sourcing everything has been something that David has drilled into all all of us, um, and that we're all extremely committed to. So what we try to do is help others do this analysis with what we've been working on and then move to the next development to provide that to others as well. So Lauren, you, um, you are the molecular detective, right? Yes. You're, uh, it's amazing. And one of the things that's happened over the last year is that Treehouse has become a place where students, both undergraduate and graduate students, have sought uh, to work and to learn. And it's because um, of this bridge between the partnerships that we can have with Stanford, for instance, and the computational genomics work. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, I just want to start by saying that I'm so honored to be here tonight with all of you. And I'm, I'm so honored to be part of the Treehouse Initiative. You know, I've always wanted to be a molecular detective, even though I didn't call it that. You know, I, you know at, at, when I was 18 going into college, what, I, what, what drove me was curiosity about how, you know, how does the human body work and how do cells interact with each other and then how do they you know, malfunction at the genomic level. And then what can we do about that? You know, can I, can I find something that will help with some of these, you know, devastating diseases? But I never thought that I, as a graduate student, would be able to conduct research and analysis in an arena like this because, you know, as David was saying, most graduate students are, are in labs where you know, they do their research and then they write a paper about it and they publish the paper and they don't really get to follow that through and know when or how that's going to impact a, you know, a doctor or a patient or you know, help save someone's life. Um, and I never imagined that I would be able to bridge that that gap in my PhD work and, and conduct not only my, my own research in a lab like this, but be able to be part of this analysis. And so I actually am able to conduct this analysis and work with this data from individual um, children who are undergoing treatment and looking for, for other treatments, um, and then communicate the results of that analysis to to doctors, and that's just incredible to me. I never, I never imagined that I would be able to do this. And you have presented, I believe, at this yes. point, to Stanford in particular, yes? Yes, yes, I have, yes. And um, so I've been able to communicate what I found digging through the data and looking for clinical leads, and I've been able to have that discussion with the doctors, you know, what, what how can I communicate these results in a meaningful way? What questions do you have? And, and then I've gone back, you know, with, with questions from doctors, and I've, I've gone back to the data trying to follow up on those questions and trying to bring as much as I can from what I'm looking at to, to the clinical arena. Thank you. Elena, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the actual process is. Um, what we're doing at Treehouse when a sample comes in, and then, and then tying to what Lauren was talking about, what it means to train new PhD students and get what is a developing group of expertise in this analysis. Sure, so uh, maybe this is a good point to explain what exactly we do at Treehouse and why is it different from any other uh, type of genomic <laughs> analysis. So at Treehouse, we actually focus on uh, what's called RNA. So uh, we've mentioned before that children or childhood tumors don't often have DNA mutations. I mean, some of them do, and um, you know, that's also important. But a lot of pediatric tumors actually don't have DNA level mutations that we can drug, that we can use a drug to, uh, to kill that tumor. 
And so at Treehouse, we focus on another molecule that's called RNA. And so RNA measures the amount of a gene that's turned on. And so it turns out that cancer cells can become abnormal by, by having too much or too little of a particular uh, gene turned on. And so that's measured by RNA. And so that's what we do at Treehouse. So we take data from RNA from tumors at Stanford and at other hospitals, and then we look for genes that are abnormally turned on in the tumor, so have an abnormal RNA amount. And that's where our big data comes in, because to decide what's too much, we need to really compare that one patient to other patients, and then we look for what we call outliers. So genes that are really, really highly expressed or you know, highly turned on, or there is too much of that gene in this tumor as compared to all the other samples. And so, and so we do that automatically. So there is a program um, that our uh, team members uh, wrote. Actually, Ellen is here in the audience. She's our uh, software engineer. Is really amazing. And um, this whole process I'm describing, so Ellen actually helped automate so that we could really scale up the number of uh, individuals that we can, number of individual tumors that we can process. And so, so first what happens is that Ellen's program gets run, and then there is this automatic output of genes that are abnormally turned on, and then at that point, Lauren takes a look at it and tries to reconstruct a story of what is driving that particular tumor. And so she does a lot of analysis, does some literature searches to see what's known about this tumor, what, which of those genes are maybe known players already in that tumor, and then creates a presentation that we would then present at the molecular tumor board uh, to Norm and to other clinicians. And so um, by having grad students like Lauren, um, you know, these guys really took it to the next level because we started out doing this process manually and um, you know, really kind of not uh, having a framework, and then Ellen automated it for us, and then Lauren, and we have another student, Jacob, uh, are currently developing novel analysis approaches of what else we can do. You know, what else, how can we identify these outlier genes better? Uh, how, how can we better put them into <laughs> pathways or specific categories within the cell? And so it's been really amazing having, um, having these students, and we're very honored to have them choose to work in our team. And as part of the work that the students do, it's not just um, working through the protocol that Elena's developed, it's also thinking up new approaches and trying to expand the work that we do. So Lauren, for instance, you've started working on DIPG. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit so people understand what that is? Sure. Um, so DIPG is a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is a very rare and unfortunately um, fatal uh, pediatric brain tumor that we currently have no successful treatments for. And so this is the complete focus of my PhD thesis research because I, I think it's terrible that we don't, we don't know what to do with this brain tumor. Um, and so some of the analysis that I've done is, is using our, our outlier analysis that Alana just described to try and see if I can find patterns in a, a database of, of um, data from DIPG patients. Um, and I'm going to take that further and develop some more analysis methods and take them back to the data and, and keep working through it until I'm able to find um, some sort of uh, you know, pattern or something that, that will allow us to sort of crack the code of this particular tumor and then take that into um, preclinical testing, you know, and, and try and understand really what's going on and where are some vulnerabilities that we could potentially attack here. Um, we try at Treehouse 2 as part of this, as Lauren embarked on this area of work, to provide some information to the public about what, th what this means and the work that we're doing. And when you were talking, I was remembering too that uh, we have Joya in the audience here, I think in the back there, who also Joya. who has started writing blogs for Treehouse as well, and so wrote one on DIPG explaining the work that we're doing. So part of our mission is not just the analysis, but it's also explaining the utility of genomics 
to the public. And part of our primary concern when we do that is to make sure that the research makes it um, into the clinical space and that patients and their families can understand what kind of approach is being applied, how it can be useful, and what kind of questions to ask. And I know, Norm, that that has been a central concern as well at Stanford that is part of this project that we're trying mm -hmm. to, that we are initiating in January. No, absolutely. I mean, there, there's lots that we need to do. Um, and sorry, I'm still stuck on your DIPG because it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. I mean, these horrible. kids just yes. present, you make a diagnosis, and they're dead in six months, and and it's a slow. Nothing you can do. It's nothing you can do. It's a slow, really death where you see your child just wither away and and die within months. So, um, and there's a lot happening actually at Stanford, so I need to make sure we connect to some. Now that you bring this up here, there's some <laughs> folks we need you to work with. Uh, as there, there may be some promising immunotherapy actually for this disease, so I think Wonderful. it's... And that brings me another link to the immunotherapy about the, immu the immunogenomics, where mm -hmm. we need yes. to understand that better, and we have a robust program now, and I think we, I mean, we also have to figure out how to bring that together with you guys, right. um, especially in this, in this area, because I think it would be a benefit, so... It's great. We're going to get some work done on this day. I know. <laughs> uh, we are, actually we have a new treehouse uh, system that mm -hmm. we're within a month or two of releasing, which checks for all the immunogenomics opportunities for every kid. Is there an opportunity to use That's immunotherapy on this child? Uh, as many of you have heard, and as Norm can elaborate, this is a spectacular new mode of treatment in cancer that has been extremely successful in many adult cancers, and we would hope to see it used in childhood cancers soon. Absolutely. So again, every time someone says something, I just keep going. I mean, there's so many many things we can do together that mm -hmm. it never ends. But uh, I'm sorry, it's in my hearing. But are you saying amino? Um, immuno. immuno, immunology, immuno. the immune system. Mm -hmm. okay. It's using your own immune system to attack and kill cancer cells. Very exciting new therapy. And then going back on your RNA reference, at least in, again, I focus on leukemia, so for an AML patient there's so many novel transcripts. Mm -hmm fusion products Fusions, that are, yes. mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. see by classical cytogenetics, right. so it's, an, it's really, that's why it's important working with uh, your guys. I mean, yeah, we have collaborations with other big centers, but I mean, this is unique what we have with you guys, and, and again, the focus on the RNA, doing the RNA sequencing is very important for us, especially for pediatric cancers, because the genome tends to be a little bit qu much mm -hmm. quieter, right. as yes. we alluded to, and it's all the RNA and also right. the epigenome, and I know Mm -hmm. I know we'll also get there with you guys. We will. We are on our way to the epigenome as well. This has become very normal for us, but actually this model of a computational group working with hospitals, different hospitals, is very unusual. And uh, you can hear the synergies that are created once that connection is made. So it's people from different disciplines coming together, which is precisely the objective behind precision medicine. And um, we, f we feel honored that we're living it out, really. Um, it's, it's just a great honor. And I have never seen students so passionate about their work. It's, you know, you, when there's something that needs to be analyzed before the tumor board, you'll see these messages coming in at 2 a.m. and then at 4 a.m. And we are processing the data, and we will have it in time for the tumor board at Stanford. Uh, yeah. They are, I know, you oh, yeah. and your colleagues are 100% involved and committed to this. And it, it's a profound experience, I'm sure, as a student. I mean, we get amazing feedback, like, that changed my life. This was not normal you know, going to UC to get educated kind of thing. This was huge. Yeah, it's a very unique experience. Um, I do want to say we have a couple other Treehouse people in the room. So we have Rob Curry over there who um, leads our technical operations and has helped design with Ellen our engineering. 
and Ted Goldstein, who is now Ted, at Ted. UCSF primarily, oh, but <laughs> um, was one of the bright lights that got um, the initial California Governor Award funding for Treehouse. And so with that, I'd like to open it up to questions um, and find out if there's anything that we can answer for you. Yes? Focus mostly solid tumors, or do you also look at uh, leukemia? I mean, I think, you know, leukemia, we're approaching 93% cure. So there is a need there. I mean, in spite of that, half of our deaths are related to leukemia and some lymphoma. But solid tumors, there's really a, a big need in that area, and especially brain tumors. And I mean, the APG is again, less common, but it's just an example of a disease that is fatal. I mean, once you're diagnosed, your child will, will die of this. So yes, there's, there's a focus on the solid tumors, but we've done many leukemia cases, um, and, and it's approaches like this, I think, that will take us to that magic number of 95 to 98 percent, and hopefully one day 100 percent. But, mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, our, our interaction with you guys, we've Treat, you know, any patient that has refractory, relapse refractory disease, we bring it to this forum and share the sa have the samples uh, process and, and analyze and study. Yeah. yeah. What do you do when you find a, or if you find a molecular mutation for which there isn't a drug available? Do you have connections either with pharma or do you go to this? Stanford or UCSC chemistry or biology group uh, to develop such a drug? Where does it go? Where does it go from there? Well, I could start with that and then Elena can chime in. So there isn't time to develop a new drug in these cases for specifically for a, a mutation in a gene that if you want to design a drug that would go right after that gene. But genes all work together in these uh, pathways. So one gene controls the next gene, which controls the next gene. Uh, and you may have branching pathways so that there are many consequences and many what we call upstream events that trigger this. And so what we look for is by looking at the RNA sequence and the gene expressions, we look for some other gene that is functionally important to get the same bad cancer growth and has a drug, possibly off-label or for mm -hmm. adult cancer, that attacks that other gene. So we try to find a, another vulnerability. And if you don't find that? Well, uh, Elena has an, uh, the team, Laura and Elena have an amazing track record for finding uh, these vulnerabilities. So um, just to add to, to that, so, so the focus of Treehouse is very practical. So we try to help a child with what's available to them today in the clinic, that particular patient. But we also are interested in novel research, developing new agents. And so as part of that, uh, Lauren, for example, has a collaboration uh, with uh, University of Pittsburgh where she's doing cell line work. So we have a collaborator who is growing DIPG cells in the dish. So he has DIPG cell lines, and then he can test novel agents um, that are not yet available in the clinic in those cell lines. And if he gets good results, then maybe we could think about you know, new trials and things like that. So we do have that element as well, research into novel uh, compounds. And maybe you can yeah. say a few words about that. Right, right. And so that's what I was, that's what I was alluding to um, with the, the beginning of my research in, into DIPG is that, you know, I've done this outlier analysis on, on um, some DIPG samples. And in this collaboration with this uh, professor who's also very passionate about finding an answer for DIPG, we've been able to... Um, test some some drugs that have never been considered for for pediatric brain tumors on these DIPG cells, um, and this was work still in progress, but it seems to be somewhat promising. Um, and so this is the the research aspect of of, of my work. Mm -hmm. 
So tree, just to say the treehouse just sort of has this dual um, work environment. And one of them is what Elena was describing, which is this just this push. You know, this, this program with Stanford, it's 24 months. It's 24 months because we know that these kids are in dire shape and they need answers as quickly as they possibly can. And so we come in on the analysis side on a very practical level. But at the same time, we're a research institute, and it is vital to us that we move forward the research that's going on. And so there are these two pieces of research that coexist, or, or of Treehouse that coexist. Sorry, George. Well, what do you need to expand this program to expand the availability of these types of diagnostic services? A lot. <laughs> um, well, Besides more money. In no, 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 no. Absolutely. Right. So, so we just to give you a sense of the timeline. We talked about that a little bit, but we started in in 2014 with this lemonade stand. Realized that there was this enormous interest. Got funding at late 2015 and have built this team. So yes, part of the answer is funding, but part of it is depth as well. And so one of the things that we've seen, this discussion that we were having about the practical side, you know, the need to really reach out to partners and hospitals and work with the kids. Um, and we don't work with the kids ourselves. We work with the, the doctors who work with the kids. Um, has to be matched by the depth of research so that we're moving it forward. And so what I would say is, yes, it's money, but it's also an ability to do the full cycle of what research means, right? It's the pra practical application of it, new discoveries as we're doing that, but also being able to teach undergraduate and graduate students so that there's a new group of people doing this analysis. And really, I think, you know, when, when I first came on and Elena and I would go to conferences, Elena was just about the only person out there doing this work, right? And that was just a couple of years ago. That is changing and being part of that change is really important. So for us, as we're building the Genomics Institute, Part of it is also building these focus areas, like in pediatrics, so that it's not just working on cases that come through. That's absolutely critical, and it's building more and more relationships with hospitals. But it's also being able to be an educational provider, building coursework for, for students so that they learn, um, incubating new brilliant researchers. And so having experts who are, um, good at working with people, with teaching, as well as experts who are incredible software engineers and can automate our programs so that we do things faster. I'll, I, I want to let Elena speak to this, but uh, we have talked many times about the fact that uh, testing for the RNA gene expressions is not the standard thing that cancer care, even genomic cancer care does in most institutions. And if we are really going to solve this problem, we need to have a lot of institutions doing RNA sequencing along with the DNA tests that they're currently doing. So we really want to see both DNA and RNA tested in every child who has cancer. To get there, we, we really need, I think, to organize a effort to do this RNA sequencing and possibly be significantly involved in, in, in our own laboratory uh, efforts in that regard. And Elena is currently close to being uh, a clinically certified laboratory director uh, based on your program. And I think you have dreams in this regard. Yeah, so, um, so, um, uh, so basically the, the way that clinical testing works is that there is this concept of CLIA or CAP accreditation. Um, that a lab needs to have to offer testing that then gets entered in the clinical record, that insurance can reimburse, and, and, and so on. And I think um, one vision we have here is to uh, make sure that what we do is available to everybody. And to do this, we need to make this a routine test. Once we, of course, show in our collaboration with Stanford and others that this is useful, the next step is to make it routine. And so for that, uh, we would like to develop this clinical lab infrastructure, so CLIA, a CLIA lab that would be able to offer testing that could be part of routine <coughs> medical care. And so that's really our 
vision? That would be a long-term vision and a, a very big change for the way cancer diagnosis is done. I had a question which you just partially answered, but I'm curious, do you foresee that this is something like a central lab somewhere that everything in the country comes to, or does this become something like we clone Lauren and we have one of her on every staff in every hospital, or somebody does something like that this now becomes a standard job title in, 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 a, in the average medical center? How, how do you see this working, or is this, or is this something that you only do in a central location, but then you hand out the information? I think that's a great question, if I may say. I think maybe both, you know, clone Lauren, also clone Ellen, <laughs> so that, and clone Ted, <laughs> so that we have both a very strong... Uh, I don't know if we want to clone Ted. <laughs> <laughs> so that we have a lot of automation, but also have a human analyst on the other side, because what we find is that it is important to have a human being review kind of the automated prediction, and so teaching people, like Isabel was saying, so, it's, so, so that many people can do this analysis, I think, is the way to make it more widely, um, widely. Do you think that we standardly part of ordinary hospital staff in the lab that they now have for testing blood? Do you think always, there'll always soon be somebody like that? Is that the future you see? Oh, I see. Um, I don't <laughs> But that is something sure. of a dream. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Really, no, that is something that of a dream. We, yeah. we would like to see genomic analysis make its way into the medical world everywhere so that patients who have cancer can benefit from that kind of analysis. And it goes back to, you know, some of this goes back to the open sourcing dedication mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. Genomics Institute has because as we're developing new methods, we put it out there for people to use. And so it's not just teaching the students at UCSC, although that's a big piece of it. Um, it's also being able to provide all that information to other researchers and move research forward through that open sourcing. So that, yeah, the idea is that you would have innovation multiply. And we would like to embed genomic analysis within medical care. We do have to develop more artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, very sophisticated data analysis into our procedure. Uh, absent cloning Lauren too many times, uh, we yeah we do we do need uh, need to make it so there are fewer experts needed to handle all of the different cancer cases. This is of course obvious for adult cancer uh, where the numbers are just astronomical. Uh, but even for pediatric cancer, I think we need more automation. Can I make a quick comment? I know you have a question, sir. I think it's a hybrid of what you were asking, mm -hmm. but the unique advantage of the Santa Cruz group is the open, is the open source. If we sequence someone in the hospital in our, within our system, there are a lot of regulations, and there's a limit to what you can do with the data. So I think what's unique about the group at Santa Cruz is that it's open. You deposit the data, it's identified. And again, like Dr. Houser says, if you embed machine learning, it's just using that, that data continues to inform other cases, other patients, other diseases. So I think that's a unique thing that I would probably say you want a hybrid, but the Europeans are, have that upon us where, again, they have more of a Euro, you know, Euro, flow, Euro flow where they do full cytometry and all leukemia space. Or you, I mean, they really have a continental approach to it, and can really dump all the data in and learn from the data, the totality of the data, as opposed to everything having walls around it, and you, you know, you can't talk to the next hospital or the next center or the next state because of regulations. You had a question. I guess my my, my question sort of uh, follows up on this something I've discussed with uh, Dave in the past. Uh, let me give you a little bit of context for the question. Uh, I'm Ramakel, I'm a professor in technology information management at Santa Cruz. At Stanford, I taught in management, science, and engineering, but my most recent uh, stint was at the medical school, Beamer. Uh, so, so my question is the following. If you think of EMRs, right, and processing those uh, for either disease progression or prediction intervention, that's the other extreme from genomics, if you will. And of course, in the middle, you've got the biome, if you will. So, so my question, and the models I've been looking at are much more dynamic models for prediction and intervention. So now if you think of the types of things you've been describing, um, and as you now engage with patients and so on, 
do you and uh, do you see a way that things are more dynamic in terms of treatment procedures so that you uh, there's sort of a natural combination of the types of uh, methods I think that have been developed right in Dave's lab and with this whole thing. Uh, but is there a way to go forward to merge with the dynamic models? And the reason I ask this question is uh, when we are presenting a paper on, say, for example, ICU interventions type of thing, right? <coughs> somebody from Baylor stepped up and said, look, I see a way of integrating this with genomics uh, and I'd like to do it. But I'm sort of curious about your sense of using more <coughs> dynamic models of the type Daphne, Colin, and others used, but more in your context along with the more genomic type models. <laughs> so maybe start with you and let the others pick, them up, pick up the question. It's complicated. There's so many roadblocks, but for ex for example, leukemia, what we're moving to is for for our treatment protocols is more of a neural network where you really do extensive, deeper testing each patient, and you can put patients to different bins and take them through different pathways, which would mean different treatment protocols. So it's the same backbone therapy, but you add different drugs depending on what molecular lesions or what fusion products are, what you can target, or what epigenetic, <laughs> you can, or the, even the, the immunome, what, you know, how can you exploit immunotherapy? So I think that's where we're trying to go, but it's very difficult. Now one thing we haven't talked much, which this project is doing, I said, right, is understanding from the phalanx perspective, what is genomic testing? What mm -hmm. does it mean with, from the perspective of the physician? Mm -hmm. How can you bridge this because you know, we have patients who show up, it's your dear, the most precious thing, your child, and, and then, you know, we want to biopsy the primary tumor, but we want to biopsy a lung metastatic lesion, a liver metastatic lesion, so Ellen and the group have, you know, have these, have, have these samples so they can look at the heterogeneity of the tumor, the different targets, and try to help us figure out, is there, can you repurpose a drug that treats one pathway and one lesion to a different pathway and, and the primary lesion and so forth. Uh, again, that's what we want to do, and you know we need people like the folks at Santa Cruz to help us achieve that. And again, going back to your question, we need really a, a central repository where you can really have all the data and keep learning from the data. And Does the data going to the Latin thousand cases also show the treatment, and if the treatment was successful, or just raw data of the a lot of outcome data, so um, we do it looking at survival curves and so forth because there is enough information to see what the subsequent uh, like pattern is for each of the individuals for the most part. The treatment data is good but not great. With the, it's, this is a standard uh, complaint that we do not get enough information about the treatment and it's very, very hard to get that information on a large scale. Because you have to get it back from the hospital. You have to get it's it. not under your control. So right, you exactly. And there are lots of regulations uh, yeah. in the way of collecting those data. And Norm actually talked a little bit. We get, well, the data we get uh, at UC Santa Cruz is de-identified, right? So tracking what is happening in particular cases is, is something that we'll start doing with the Stanford project, and that's very innovative with this particular project. Um, but it's not something in the past that we've been able to do. Right, because at this point then it's a little limiting for the other institution. I mean, they can obviously use the data right. for um, understanding what type of cancer they have, but they do not yet if they can use that treatment. I saw, I just want to say there was somebody in the back who's had their hand up a couple times. I just wanted to acknowledge that I saw that. <laughs> and, and then I'm sorry, we'll come back to you. So I think open sourcing the whole thing is, uh, will, will have a profound impact on how things are done later on because of the lack of data. So have you considered uh, having a crowdsource way of actually parents whose kids are in therapy to actually upload the data and give consent because uh, norm, there, are, there are very few ways except for skimming through, uh, it, you know, you can mine Facebook groups where parents come yes, and chat about absolutely. things. Yes, absolutely. No, it's, but, there's uh, an there enormous no, amount of information, yeah. Yeah, there's no real information. So Rob should speak to this, uh, but I'll just introduce him while he, you're handing him the mic. Uh, he's built uh, a couple of trial systems. He's working very, very intensely with UCSF now. And yes, we abundantly believe that 
parents of young patients and patients themselves, if they are of age, should be able to make the decision, yes, I want to share my information with the scientific community so that everyone can learn from my case. And I think institutions are not living up to their responsibility of making that easy and a natural and an accepted way of, uh, an accepted part of medicine. It should be part of medicine. And I often say that the, you know, the current way informatics is done in the medicine is essentially, you know, we're in the 1950s, right? And other yes. sectors of society have gone into this century, but, but medicine is last century in terms of these information technologies. So we absolutely have to make use of those. We have so much more capability on our cell phone than, than we do in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with our medical uh, information. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, well, I'll just say, you know, this is a societal problem, and, you know, what better place than UC Santa Cruz to kind of merge, you know, <laughs> what's the science mean, and what's this mean to society? Um, so, yeah, in Treehouse, I think pretty much every single kid is in, back in the compendium. That's yeah. right. All in that kids, database of 11,000. We update it, you know, we're striving to update it maybe every month or two, so you can, you know, if a, if a parent loses a child, at a minimum, they want to know that that child's, you know, process at least helps the next child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you talk about a learning healthcare system, you hear about politicians talking about it. This is it right here. I mean, we can show it to you in, you know, detail. Um, but there's also a variety of other programs in the institute. You know, this is somebody with cancer. You can't do your own biopsy, um, not very easily. Um, but hereditary cancer, for example, at home hereditary testing. Uh, Melissa back there, who was one of the founders of this, also um, uh, head of a program called the BRAC Exchange, uh, which has hereditary cancer. So we're working towards a program where if you get tested at home by color genomics for $99, how can we start to engage society in a conversation about donating your data back? becoming part of the problem. If you receive a, a test result that says, we don't know what this means, you should be presented with a, with a piece of paper or an iPhone app. They've built an iPhone app that says, would you like to participate in solving that problem? Um, at UCSF, uh, out, of, out of options GI patients are now presented with a piece of paper saying, would you like to donate your data to the internet? And if they say yes, within about 24 hours, it's up for anybody in the world to see. So we're definitely moving in that direction. It's also true that we have two people on our staff at Treehouse whose jobs are their data coordinators, and they spend a ridiculous amount of time searching for more data from other scientists and other teams across the world and adding that to that compendium of 11,000. So, you know, every month, as Rob's describing, that compendium grows, and it's available to other researchers to use. Yeah. Yeah, but thank Sorry. You. Everything's good. Um, first, a real quick question. Do the grad students get paid anything? No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> it's slave labor, actually, yeah. at UC Santa I, Cruz. No. Don't bring it up. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Their awesome. studies are supported, My yes. Question is, with this open sourcing thing, is you have to do provide computers and storage for all this information and everything. There's must be huge cost behind this. How is it funded? Well, yes, yeah. We yeah, have yeah. that. It's no. It's a we, really good question. The funding is is a, is a problem in pediatric cancer. There's not enough funding in pediatric cancer at all. And you're right. The costs are quite high. Just to answer directly your question, we are very lucky to be funded by the California Governor's Office. We're also very lucky to be funded by St. Baldrick's Foundation, which supports cancer research for kids. We are incredibly lucky to have local donors who support our program. Having said all of that, um, it's also true that we operate on a shoestring. Um, we do our best to find solutions in any which way we can to make this happen. And everybody on our team is incredibly dedicated to that. But yes, the graduate students are paid. They're supported, yes. yes. <laughs>
<laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm conscious that we've we've gone slightly over an hour, and I and I don't want to keep you here too long. I want to make sure that there aren't additional questions that we've missed. No, no, no. Please, I just I'm just saying I, yeah, I do ahead. recognize we need to wrap up soon. Um, at a recent uh, past crawl lecture, there was a lot, a lot of discussion about RNA and the dark matter of RNA. A lot of these genes are completely unannotated. They're not in pathways. They're not in the literature. Yet you're collecting this information on them. Uh, what are your thoughts on using that? And uh, how do you see the future of transcriptomics going to things like this? Mm -hmm. Elena, this I, is for you. I think this is a great question, and this is why I think it's important to collect uh, these data, even if we can't use it today, uh, because these are rare diseases, and there are actually 16 different types. I mean, there are different ways to count uh, pediatric cancers, but let's say 16 different types under this word, pediatric cancer. And so collecting data from every child is very important so that we don't lose that information. And so for right now, we have this practical angle where we focus on genes uh, that we know that are druggable targets, but we're also collecting information uh, for other researchers to mine on novel genes. And in terms of uh, novel genes, we actually have a collaboration at UC Santa Cruz. We have a researcher, uh, Daniel Kim, who is studying non-coding RNA, and we've had conversations about how can we leverage these data that we're collecting and how can he use it in his research to discover and characterize some of these novel players, which there are a lot, as you say. It's gonna be many new exciting discoveries. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank all of you for coming and learning about what we're doing.